Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today was a developer at Valve for over 14 years and worked on titles such as Half-Life 2 and Portal 2. I'd like to welcome Joshua Wire. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, thank you so much for taking time out. I'm sure this is development time, so I appreciate it. Uh, that's all right. I'm always, it's always fun to go back and reminisce on what I've done in the past, especially Portal 2, because it was such a massive part of, of my uh, gaming career. Yeah. Well, uh, you worked on that for quite a long time. So does it get to a point where things just blur? Like, can you remember everything vividly? Or I, is it just know, it, stuff that's just blurred? Half-Life 2 is more blurry to me because that was so long ago. Yeah. Um, and I was really young, like at the time. I think I, I turned 21 when I started working on that. So that was like, you know, most of my adult, you know, career life was at Valve. But um, it's weird because I... I I would say, no, I don't remember. And then I was like, oh, I'll just watch a playthrough quick just to refresh my memory. And it was like, oh yeah, that bug. And I remember that place and oh yeah, that thing. And it, it just came flooding back really quickly. So yeah, I, I think I was just so intimately involved because I was the project lead. It was like just every little piece I knew about. Um, although it, it's funny because there, I run into maps where I'm like, I don't remember this map being the shipping map. I remember playing it a lot in the testing phases. And then at some point the artist came in and like, made it look amazing and i'm kind of like it, it's like going back to somewhere after 20 years and you're like i think i grew up here but i don't quite remember it looking like this like it just has this strange like almost nostalgic uh feel to it in that way so yeah it was kind of weird to go back and and relive it yeah so how did you end up becoming the project lead on portal 2 was that something that you advocated for or did it did no, you just get approached uh, to do it yeah it was kind of a weird thing so when we were working, so I worked on episode two as well. Yeah. And so making episode two was hard and making TF2 was hard and making Portal was hard, but we thought, hey, why don't we make it even harder and we'll ship them all at the same time. So that's when we shipped the orange box. And on top of that, we were like, hey, let's also ship on the Xbox, which we hadn't really done much console work. So we didn't really know what we were in for. So it was just this massive, awful like deadline trying to get that to work. And after that, everyone was super tired. And it was kind of weird because the whole company had kind of finished at the same time where you usually were like staggered um, so that, you know, things are coming out at a d different pace. And so after that, um, some of the, the guys who were trying to think about what to do with the company, especially Tom Leonard, who was working there at the time, said, hey, why don't we do something more interesting? Why don't we break up into a bunch of little teams and we're going to do what we're going to call the um, design experiments. And we're just going to basically take some time make little teams of like four to five people. One person's going to lead it just to give them a chance to have some, you know, you know, ability to show that they could lead or how they work with people. And it, it didn't, it could be gameplay. It could be technology. It could be art. It didn't really matter. It was just going to be kind of a somewhat structured thing that we could all do so that we could sit down and like, um, just kind of jam a bit. Mm. And then the hope was that we would take whatever we came up with and that would kind of roll into the next thing. But it was a kind of this nice, creative reset. And I think what he was thinking too, and I didn't realize at the time is that it was kind of a good way for him to say, let's give like a bunch of people a chance to like lead projects and be more in a management role with really low risk. Right. Because if they completely flop on this little experiment, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, two, three months, it's not a big deal. And so we had all kind of gone off. And um, I think just naturally at the time I was becoming a little bit more in a leadership role in EP2. And so they were like, hey, you take some people and you captain this one. And so we went off and we what made what was called F-Stop. Um, and we've never really talked about that, so I can't go into the details. But F-Stop was, um, it was a puzzle mechanic and it was a lot, it was kind of in the vein of Portal. That's kind of how we had pitched it as like, hey, here's this cool little thing and gave a presentation on it. And everybody was super excited about it. And they were like, oh man, this is great. Somehow this has to be Portal 2. Um, so they're like, okay, you're going to be the lead of it. And you're going to co-lead with Garrett Ricky, who was a super smart guy who was on portals or the original portal team, um, mm. from DigiPen. So he and I kind of looked at each other and were like, okay, because, <laughs> um, that team had been working on their own pitch for what they thought portal two would be. And we were working on something separate and now they were kind of trying to cram the two worlds together and go, okay, guys, come up with something that works with this. And F-Stop was not necessarily something that fit easily into that world. And we were coming at it from this standpoint of like, well, this is the puzzle mechanic. This is what the company is telling us they want. So let's figure out how to cram that in there. And so, yeah, from that point on, it was just like six months of beating our head against the wall, trying to get that to work until we were able to kind of, we had a few events happen that really helped fix that for us and got what Portal 2 ultimately was kind of, kind of rolling. But that's how I fell into it. It was kind of 
did this little thing and it worked out. And then they put me on a bigger thing and, you know, they just kept piling responsibilities on me until I fell over. <laughs> <laughs> well, it teaches you, what is it? Uh, sink or swim sort of That's mentality. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've seen the the pictures that you posted, I think on Twitter of mm. the, the initial stick men whiteboard drawings. So was it, yeah. was the entire game mapped out <clears throat> that way? Like room by room? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, it was one really cool thing about portal. Like, you know, I was looking back on HL2 and HL2 is hard because there's a lot of art assets. It was really organic things, you know, flowed in different ways and it was just really convoluted in a bunch of senses. So that was hard to put out, but portal kind of in its conceit was about testing and it was about these little test chambers and we sort of inherited that structure. So it was great from a design standpoint because we could, we could just say, this is the room elevator here, elevator there. Gladys says something when you come in, she says something when you go out, maybe there's some interactions in between. And it just let us focus on like, okay, what are we trying to teach you in this one test chamber? So it was really awesome way to focus our design because we weren't trying to mix a bunch of things together. It was like, all right, this one's all about the redirection laser uh, boxes. We need to teach you this. How are we going to do it? Okay, let's lay it out. And then it was really fast to go make that because, you know, the, the test chambers were pretty boxy. And so it was really, really quick to just kind of bang that together and go, okay, done. And there were a couple of neat little tricks we did too, where <clears throat> usually it's kind of annoying in game development where it's like, okay, if we're going to put an elevator on one side and an elevator on the other side, you have to physically kind of move them into place and, you know, make sure everything was adjusted. But we got portals so good and the transition so seamless that what people don't know is that when you're coming and going out of those elevators, they're actually portals at those doors. So you walk through that door, it's actually a portal. It just doesn't look like one. And so we could do these cool things where we would just <sighs> basically say this elevator, which is randomly over here in space, connects to this room. And then that connects to this other thing that's over somewhere else in space. And you could just logically like, you know, eyedropper and say, go to there, go to there, go to there. And we could also then um, do that with multiple different test chambers. So it was super cool because it just freed us up from a bunch of boring stuff, right? The elevator could just be this really nice felt thing, could live anywhere. And no one ever knew that we had, you know, been using portals behind the scenes as like developers, not just, you know, in the gameplay sense. So that was always kind of this fun thing that I don't think anyone ever really noticed because, um, uh, David Kircher, who did a ton of the work on the portals and making them seamless, had got it so good that you just never knew. You ah. just, you're just stepping into a, a hallway, but and really you're like, you know, teleporting over a huge, vast space. That's so interesting. So mm. how do you get the gameplay mm. ramping right in terms of puzzles, right? Because you don't want yeah. it to be too hard where people are just like, I have no idea how to complete this. Yeah, uh, that took a lot of work. But I, the big thing that we did for Portal was uh, playtesting was really the heartbeat of it we kind of settled on a structure where it was like, okay, every Friday, we're going to bring somebody in. They're going to play our work. We're going to talk about it Monday, and then we're going to do it again on Friday. And so that just ended up being this really good heartbeat for the project because it scoped our work really clearly. And it made that just really simple to know what the next best thing to do was. And part of that was us sitting down saying, okay, we know we have um, X number of mechanics. So what we did at first was originally when we started portal, it was kind of more like a hub structure. Um, just so that we could test things. And so you'd be in this little hub and that's kind of what co-op ended up adapt, uh, adopting. So you'd go off down these little corridors and we'd come up with like five or six mechanics. I think all of them shipped except for one. Um, and we just laid track with that. It was just like, okay, um, you're going to do all the catapults. You're going to do all the cat, uh, tractor beams. You're going to do all the, um, uh, the laser redirection and all that stuff. And then within each track, you would have like, okay, well, here's the intro. We just have to show you the most basic thing. And then maybe we'll show you another thing. And then we'd have what we would call like a quiz where we would kind of take what you had learned and try to make you apply it a little bit different than what you had. Mm. And then we'd always have something that was called the, we called the graduation where that was like, it's, there's some lateral thinking involved in this. It's not just do by rote what you've done before. It's like, Hey, we're going to ask you to extend your knowledge and your thinking a little bit now that we've trained you well enough. And so once we kind of had that arc, we would sit that down and say like, okay, we think that's the right arc. And then we would just play test that and see where people got stuck. And it was a hard thing because, you know, I think Porter was kind of cool in that we didn't have difficulty levels and that kind of everybody felt really smart, even though everybody was doing the same thing. Like we didn't give you a lot of chances to do different things, but I think that that step of that lateral thinking made you feel like, Oh yeah, I came up with this. This is, I'm a genius. Like no one's thought of this. And <laughs> when really it's like, you know, everybody thought of it, but that's okay. Yeah. And so as we were play testing, we had to be really careful because um, sometimes we'd bump into a problem and we'd have to be like, okay, is this person an outlier? What is it that they didn't see? And, and it, we had a really big process around like, 
how to ask questions in a non-leading way. So we could try to go like, because we, we would think like, I don't think they saw the button, but I can't ask them if they saw the button because then they're going to, you know, so it was like trying to figure that out. And we'd always just kind of take the smallest steps back we could until we started to hit enough traction. Where we're like, okay, now people are getting it. Let's not touch it anymore. Um, because we didn't want to, you know, obviously fall back too far or have one person who's an outlier and then go, oh, we got to like change everything. And then, you know, the other nine people who played would have been fine. So that was just, I mean, we played those test chambers hundreds of times. So it was just like refinement, refinement, refinement. And that's, that's kind of how it all worked out. But then it was kind of weird as a pacing on top of that, because you had the puzzle pacing, but then you also had the story pacing. Yes. Um, and when I was watching through, I had forgotten something that happened because in the beginning of the game, the test chambers are kind of ruined. Yeah. And you're, you're watching Gladys rebuild them. And then you hit this point where everything's fixed. And we realized as we were doing that, what, that when you got to the part where everything was fixed, it looked really boring. Like everything was, it had been like back to sterile and, and nice. So we are like, well, this doesn't work. And that's why right when she's like, hey, I fixed everything. It's great. That's when Wheatley takes you off behind the scenes. And we did that over and over again, where we'd have to wait till like, okay, I think this is just where it's about to get boring. And we throw you a curveball and kind of push you into the next sequence so that it never got to the point where you felt like, man, I'm tired of these white walls. I'm tired of, you know, the, you know, just what I've been seeing for so long. We, we just had to keep finding ways to make that fresh. And so that was this extra layer of going, okay, we got, seven puzzles to get through but we also have to like throw in enough stuff to keep you mentally busy because a lot of times people will be like well, why am i just solving puzzles so it's like okay yeah we have to wheatley has to come in and you know give you a little bit of uh, motivation to move forward or gladys has to do something that prompts you so it was this really tight coupling between the designers and the storytellers to figure out how to make those mesh really well so that one didn't feel abrupt and you didn't you didn't feel like you were soaking in this really boring environment for a long time. We really just wanted to kind of keep you going, especially because it was weird in that you would like have this chase sequence and then you'd be thrown into a puzzle and you'd spend 15 minutes in a puzzle beating your head against the wall. And it's like chase sequence and then back into a thing. So that was weird too. It was like, you would just have these really abrupt starts and stops. And so again, it was just, we just played the hell out of it and just watched and watched and tweaked and talked. And yeah, it was just this labor of love of like constant iteration. So what was the thing that came first? Was it story that was the main focus and then gameplay or was it the reverse? Because no. the thing is yeah, as well, because usually with games, if you tweak something to the story when you're partway through to de the development, you have to end up messing with the gameplay and changing stuff around right. sometimes, which I would think in Portal 2 or Portal for that matter, it wouldn't be as much of an issue. Mm -hmm. and, and you guys didn't really have cut scenes either. So right. yeah. But so we, so Eric Wolpa and, and Jay Pinkerton were the main writers and, and Chet Falasek worked on co-op, but that was kind of its own, like that was his own thread. Those guys just ran and did their thing. Jay and Eric just like, I mean, they, first of all, they killed themselves on that project. They worked so hard on that, but they were really intent on waiting as long as they could before doing the actual work. And, and it was part of that where they were just like, look, I don't want to write a bunch of stuff. And then you guys come in and change it. Like, you know, you wave your wand of like, well, this takes me five minutes to do. And you just waved away, like you said, you know, five months of our work. So they just kind of waited and waited and waited. And in that time, they were sort of building up. They're putting in the bank, I think, things they knew that would work. So they were putting in jokes that they knew were going to be kind of able to put anywhere. But in terms of like the overarching story, that kept getting refined and tweaked and changed and, you know, uh, jostle around up until the last minute and it's funny because even when i watched back in the playthrough there were things that i kind of forgot were in there because they were so incredibly late that a lot of the cave johnson stuff and especially the carolyn stuff was super late in the game oh. so some of it i'm kind of hearing going oh yeah i forgot we recorded that because it literally was in the last month and i was so like crazy doing other stuff i didn't have eyes on on that um but even stuff like um the moonshot at the end um, where you, you know, you shoot the portal yeah, on the moon, shoot spoilers the moon yeah. for everybody. Yeah. It's been out long enough. You, I think, yeah, you know, I, th I think so. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that was this really late thing. And that was a funny process too, because I was in most of the meetings and, uh, that meeting I, I didn't go into, I was just like, I got stuff to do. You guys got this, like go crazy. And they came back and everyone was like, Hey, we had this idea. And I was like, Okay, I hope we can pull that off. But I, I think that was the nice thing about working at Val. I was like, if you guys are super passionate, you're going to make it work. Like, I'm kind of scared of it, but it sounds great. Go crazy. Um, and then at that point, that was pretty late in the process too. And so the writers had to go, 
okay, like why can you shoot a portal on the moon? And that's, and then they had to kind of go back and retroactively put in a bunch of stuff with like cave getting sick from moon dust and all that stuff. Like that all came on as a result oh. of the moonshot, not as a, you know, a deliberate thing. So they were really good at going back and kind of filling in where they needed to, to make that work. And that was a big part of that refinement too, of going, okay, this seems like it's sticking. Let's go back and add as many little uh, indicators to this as we can. And so I think they did a great job of like just hustling at the end to like cram all that <laughs> stuff in. <laughs> so was it quite a linear, pro if you think of in terms of the rooms, right? Mm. Was it a linear process in terms of designing the rooms? So you'd start off easy and then get, hard, get harder as you progress? Or was it something that was just completely out of order and then you'd just mesh and change the rooms accordingly? It was a little of both um, because when we started, it was just going, okay, um, we have a catapult. So the catapults came online and they were called faith plates, but we always called them catapults forever. So they, that's another thing that came on light. They, they like add all the, the aperture science nomenclature and like yeah. it's not deep in my mind. So I'll call them catapults. But, you know, that that came from, OK, we want to do this conservation of momentum where you can fly through the air, but we don't want to just have to do drops all the time. And catapults would give us more ability to have that high flying craziness without um, having so many design constraints around what mm. the room was like. So that one was kind of more linear. It was like, okay, let's just, let's sit down. And we, we you know, we, that's where all the whiteboard drawings would come. We'd sit in a room with all the team and go, okay, let's come up with everything we can think of for catapults. And we would just, you know, bang out like five little, little um, uh, puzzles for that. And then we'd say, okay, let's build these. And then Friday we'll play test with somebody and we'll put them in a rough order. And then from that, we would kind of say, okay, well, that one's harder than this one. And obviously some of them would have to come before others because we couldn't put the, the hardest one and the thing that asked you to do the most things at the at the beginning, it would have to be at the end. So some things were easy. Other things were sort of more, you know, it, it could be A, B, or C that you learn next because they're not necessarily dependent on one another. And then it was just sort of, you know, up to us to figure it out. Other things like especially the um, projected walls that are the, the bridges that you could walk on the light bridges. Yep. Those were things that we originally thought like, oh, okay, it's traversal. It's this, we'll just make these things. But because we were iterating on a bunch and because the designers are playing with those mechanics a bunch, somebody was like, Hey, check it out. If you do it this way, you can make a wall. And we're like, Oh, what can we do with a wall? And then you'd go and make 10 more things. And then, Oh, if you do this way, it's like a ramp and this way it can do. And, you know, and then suddenly some of the mechanics would just have these weird like things that we didn't think of at first. And that was, I mean, it's not problematic in the sense of it's good to have them, but it was problematic because we had this track <laughs> and we're like, okay, well now we have to take these things and kind of fill them in there. And sometimes that meant, okay, let's cut this puzzle. It's not as exciting as this other puzzle. And so, yeah, it was this constant shuffling of like, you know, I, I had spreadsheets of what the track was and it was like, okay, this is shuffling into here and this is here and this is the hardness. And I think over time it became less, less academic and a little more gut, you know, gut feel as we had done it enough. But yeah, it was, it was definitely like just a constant revision process. Cause I think if we had sat down and made a design doc, like it would have been outdated in five minutes just because of the pace we were working at. And, and again, because we were just playing it so much that there was always something cool and interesting coming up and the team was always talking and, and just kind of, you know, there's this great creative energy around just coming up with the next thing. And I think too, because test chambers were so simple to make and also to kind of conceive you could have people who are just not map designers sit down and like whiteboard out a puzzle and go hey i've got this idea what do you think whereas normally in a game that would kind of work but it'd be a lot harder because you might be like well i don't know where to put this or that's really difficult but in portal was like oh yeah you could totally do it with a catapult in the box and all these pieces that you have um so i, I felt like there was this really great um, creative on-ramp for the team that is harder in other games where people like anybody could just come up and say, Hey, I, I thought of this thing. And then everybody would riff on that. And then that would become a puzzle. And that was really gratifying. Um, and I think that was a big key in why we had so many interesting, weird little things because it could just, these ideas could flow in from so many brains all the time. Yeah. So was there any mechanics that you just had to drop just due to time constraints or hardware limitations at the time? Uh, there were two that come to mind. So one was, um, the paints, if you remember the paints, uh, there was like yes. the blue paint for, yep. for bouncing, the repulsion gels. Yep. There was another one that I believe was purple at the time. Uh, and that one was you could walk up on walls. And oh, cool. we, we had come up with all kinds of cool <laughs> ideas for that. But the problem was that um, it just made people sick so fast. And oh. we, because I, we, we always, we for whatever reason, throughout my whole career, um, motion sickness was like this key thing that we were always bumping into because 
you know, in HL2, you had a bunch of vehicles you would drive and people would drive them and get sick right away. So this was really early in the, the game and we didn't know why that was really happening. So we were coming up with kind of all our, our random ideas for why this was. But anyway, the, the, the adherence gel, I think it was called, I don't remember. Uh, you would step on the wall and it would like rotate your camera and now the world has changed. And uh, we had one person, Mark Laidlaw, who was the writer for HL2, and Mark was really susceptible to motion sickness. So we're like, okay, I think it's okay. We've done a lot of work to smooth it out. Let's get Mark to do it. And he literally took the first step on the wall and changed his head. And he's like, I got to go lay down. <laughs> and we were like, okay, this, like, I don't think we're going to be able to get this to work. So it wasn't the worst thing to cut. Um, but I feel like that probably would have filtered out a lot of people who would have been like, I just, oh, I can't do this. And, and that would have been a shame. So we, that one didn't make it. And early in the project, we had something that was sort of a bullet time-ish a uh, mechanic where you could slow down time because the original portal had a lot more kind of reflex based gameplay. And that was good in some respects, but it tended to filter out a lot of people who would have otherwise enjoyed the game. So we tried to step back on that and say, we don't want to do a lot of reflex heavy stuff, but we thought, Hey, if we added something like bullet time, then you could jump through the air and do crazy things, go into bullet time, shoot some portals around and be a ninja. And that was true. There was a lot of neat things you could do with it, but it just felt it, it, didn't work as smoothly because you need an extra button and it just sort of felt um, a little strange compared to the rest of the game. So just from an elegant standpoint, we were like, this, this doesn't really fit with everything else. Let's just, you know, we'll weed that out and not worry about it. So mm. maybe somebody can mod that back in. <laughs> <laughs> so from a scripting standpoint and engineering standpoint, how difficult was it to implement things like the, the gels and the beams? Yeah. Um, a lot of this stuff wasn't too bad. Like I, I, Early in the project, like I, I made the the face plates and the the tractor beams. Like I was still able to sit at my keyboard for a while and do those things, and those were pretty quick, um, just because we had a robust physics system. So those things just sort of fell out automatically. The gel was really hard. Um, we so kind of in in the the I guess the tradition of Portal, we had hired some students out of DigiPen who had worked on a game that was all it was called Tag, and it was you know all about spraying paint around and doing all the things that you did, and we we're like okay, this seems like it would fit. How are we going to do this? But we had this big graphical problem, which was like, how are we going to make this not look super hokey? Because if you put a bunch of sprites, it's not going to look right. And we had had a grad student who's, I'm sorry, I his name I forget because I didn't work with him directly. But he had been working on some technology around um, creating like kind of blobby shapes out of uh, particles you don't see and kind of building meshes in real time. So it was this awesome tech and we were like, oh, give us that, please. That is exactly what we need to do, what we need to do here. Um, so he came on and he worked on that um, and it came on pretty rapidly where we just had this really cool stuff. And then neat things fell out where like, oh, you can put the paint in the tractor beam and look at all coalesces and you can move it around and do all this neat stuff. And it's like physical in this different way. Um, so that came online pretty well. But then we had given ourselves the extra challenge of wanting to be on the PlayStation at the time. And so the PlayStation just had this really different architecture than what we were used to. And so we had teams of people working just to make the blobs work on the PS3 and to utilize, you know, the way that architecture worked differently. And actually the weirdest, the hardest thing by the end ended up being the PS3, I think it was PS3, um, in that we had this really awesome sound design, like all these little robotic arms moving around and like lots of... Um, scripted sequences and the the sound guys had done it so that as the robot moved they would keyframe certain sounds to certain things so they would go bzz, 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 bzz. instead of having like one big sound for that they would break it into the components and man the ps3 was not happy with that and so that was actually the most stressful thing shipping it was we were right at the end and we were like oh my god like we have painted ourselves into this corner now where we have these sounds and we're not sure how to make that work on the ps3 and luckily you know there were some really smart guys who were able to kind of um parachute in and fix that at the zero hour so luckily we made that work and david Pfizer, who did a lot of the sound was able to like kind of frantically undo a bunch of his meticulous beautiful work to sort of like you know coalesce it back into something that would ship um but a lot of the other stuff i think was fairly straightforward actually the, the hardest thing probably technically was smoothing out portal transitions because in the first game it was pretty good but there'd be a lot of times where you'd walk through a portal and something would snap or you'd see that there was a disconnect um or you'd you'd turn through it funny and it would kind of be sickening and david kircher who had made the portals on the original game made it his life mission in this one to make them flawless and man that guy a super smart guy he spent so much time like just agonizing over every little thing and he had come up with all these weird names like there was a there's a time with portals where you kind of come up 
and like the portals here and you want to come up on a ledge. So usually what would happen is you'd like pop around in a funny way and it would just really be disconcerting. And so he came up with what he called the David Bowie move where you would kind of do this and you'd nicely come over. And he was kind of referencing in Labyrinth where the, the, the Goblin King comes around. So I, I don't know if people know about that one, but um, that was actually the, the hardest technical thing because he just wanted it to be perfect. And I think he, he got really, really close in the end and you just don't think about portals and you don't get sick moving through portals. But there's other weird things about portals too. Like um, when you jump into a portal, the worst thing in the world we saw in playtest is people would put a portal on the ground. They'd put it where they wanted to come out of. They were super hyped. They'd jump off and they'd like smack into this little pixel right next to the portal. And they'd be like, Ugh, and they'd have to climb back out and do it again. So we actually added a bunch of tech that would kind of funnel you and help you. So as you dropped, if you weren't going to hit the portal, we'd kind of push you very slightly into the portal just so you'd have a better experience. And there was a bunch of other work around, like if you're holding a box and went through a portal, a lot of times the box wouldn't come with you. And then you're like, Ugh. so we had to do a lot of work to like make the box come with you. And so that kind of stuff was all behind the scenes. And hopefully nobody ever knew that it was there. It just made your gameplay experience passively better. And you, you didn't know about that. So those oftentimes were the hardest things to try to, to hide, but also to, to make you still feel powerful when you went through the portal, even if we bumped you a little bit. This episode of Kiwi Talks is proudly brought to you by Manscaped, the world's leaders in below the waist grooming. And today I'm here to talk to you about the Performance Package 4.0, which is the ultimate peak hygiene plan. So let's get into it. First of all, we have the Lawnmower 4.0, which is an all new skin safe electric trimmer, which you can use pretty much anywhere on your body to get rid of unwanted hairs. Great tool. We also have the Crop Reviver and the Crop Preserver. The Crop Reviver is a ball spray toner and the Crop Preserver is an anti-shaping ball deodorant. Great tools for making it smell heavenly down there. On top of that, we also have jockeys and a disposable magic mat to get rid of hairs and a travel bag as well. And on top of that, we also have the Weed Whacker which you can use to get rid of unwanted hairs in your nostrils and your ears. For this exclusive offer, just go to manscaped.com and use the code KiwiTalks for 20% off plus free shipping. How difficult was the momentum physics? You know, how you jump through and then and you come out. Yeah, that from a physics standpoint, it actually wasn't too bad because um, we basically, they would just take whatever vector you had going in, they'd transform it through the portal and then you'd fly out the other end. And we, like I said, we had a really robust um, physics system from HL2. So luckily a lot of that just sort of worked. Um, the harder part was kind of making that um, fit for everybody. Cause like I said, we, the original portal had a lot of like, okay, you're going to fly out of here and shoot a portal and drop through a thing and do this. And there was actually a really specific part in portal where you would put a portal up high and you would jump out and put down another portal and then that would send you even further. Yeah, And we could see in the numbers that that cut out literally like half the audience. Like it, it seemed to be that half the audience would stop around that point because they just couldn't do it. And they're like, well, if it's only going to get harder, I don't want to do this. So that was a big reason we kind of said, oh, okay, we got to, if we want people to play this thing that we're working so hard <laughs> on, we should try to like not have that so much. So that was a harder challenge of like, we want to give you that experience of flying through the air, but we don't want to make that a skill cap thing where you're like, well, I guess I'm just not made for this game, especially since we really wanted portal to throw its arms around the biggest audience possible in a way that, you know, HL2 or TF2 didn't do right. Like they were more for gamers and we felt like portal was our opportunity to can bring younger kids into the fold, bring the parents into the fold. And especially with co-op to do all those things. And actually co-op ended up being a little bit where that stuff lived because it was fun to watch your buddy fly through the air and die and you'd laugh and it'd come back. Whereas when you did it in the single player game, you, it wasn't as funny. Yeah, so it yeah, was kind of like, of it was kind of picking our battles. <laughs> <laughs> did Gabe ever come through and watch the development or chip in any ideas? Or did yeah, he just Gabe, at that time, leave you to do he, your thing? Yeah. He was more hands off during HL2. Gabe was more involved and Gabe. I don't, if you haven't met him, Gabe is a very imposing guy. Like he's literally just a tall, tall dude. And, and also his mannerisms can be very imposing. And so when I'm like 20 and he's like an HL2, like taking me out for lunch, giving me game ideas, I'm like, yes, Mr. Newell, like, I'm just like <laughs> heads down, freaking out. Um, and I think over time, Gabe kind of realized like, oh, okay, like I should let the game teams do what I pay them for. And, you know, he would stop in and give us feedback. And, you know, I think his things were, he was worried about um, 
when we redesigned, so we redesigned Gladys for Portal 2 because she was going to have a bigger um, role and we felt like the old model wasn't quite going to give us what we needed. He was very adamant about giving Gladys a face and we were like, ah, I don't think so. Like, I think we really want to go a different direction. And so we sort of like went back and forth them a bit. And then I think after a while, he's like, all right, you guys got it. Like, I'm just going to leave you to it. And he would check in with me personally to say like, how you doing? Like, are you stressed? Like, how's life going? Um, but I think at that point he was kind of realizing that he hadn't sort of, I, I think he always wanted to be part of the team, but being Gabe and being his, in his position that never really worked, I feel, because people mm. would be like, whatever you say. And I think he was more like, no, no, no. I want to like be part of the team and come up with ideas. And that was really hard for people. So I think there was a period where he kind of stepped back and was like, all right, I guess I'm just not going to be able to, to, to interact with everyone that way. And I'll, right. I'll just work at a higher level. And, and that was all right. Yeah, I suppose that's that's understandable given the presence that he is. Mm. Yeah, and the positions he, he's in, it's like, oh my god, it would be like me yeah, and exactly. Jeremy Omoto or something about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, true, true. Was there any particular mechanic or something particular that just took you ages to get right, or just something that was a nightmare to do? Probably the hardest area was when you. It was probably the underground stuff where you fall down and you're into the old aperture area. Yeah. There's a section in the beginning where you're sort of just walking around doing exploration and you're sort of like using portals in a way that people would imagine doing that in Half-Life 2, where you're like, oh, I'm going to see this thing in the distance and put a portal and walk through and do all these things. That was actually really difficult because um, we wanted to make that interesting and fantastical, but it was so sort of out of people's I don't know, out of, out of their mind of like how they were going to approach it, that they would get into an area that was more like Half-Life 2 and they would just approach it like Half-Life 2. So they're just looking around and they're just trying to find the door to open. And we're like, no, there's a big portal surface up there. Remember you have a portal gun. They're like, yeah, yeah, I got this. I want to find a crowbar. I, I don't know what it was. It was just like it put them in a different space. So that one took a lot of work. And even in the end, I think that one was kind of one of the, the weaker areas just in terms of being able to sell it because it just, it, it didn't have, we were always able to rely on this really clear design language of like white surfaces are this and dark surfaces are like that. And now we sort of put you into this sort of monotone-ish area and we had to like be really heavy handed with like, there's a big white thing up here and everything else isn't. Um, so that was really difficult. We went, we cut a bunch, we went back and forth and, you know, we just kind of churned on that. Everything else, like I said, it was kind of like, we really quickly seized on what was working and what didn't, and then just iterated on it. So it, and everything else felt like a pretty healthy, like, you know, we put time into it, we get stuff out of it. Um, that was pretty good. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it was probably the underground that was the hardest nut to crack for us over time. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Where was a portal three ever considered or no? Cause portal, to, portal yeah. Port <laughs> <laughs> You're probably like, I'm done. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, because I think Portal Two is a, a complete package. I don't even know how mm. you would uh, improve on that. It seems like yeah. everything is complete after that. Yeah, because it was hard for us when we were making Portal Two because we're like, okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna like continue Portal because Portal sort of tried to put a bow on it itself. And Steam gave us this ability to kind of retcon in this thing, which is kind of cool. We were okay with it at the time because nobody had done it. So we're like, okay, we're technically, you know, kind of retconning this, but Steam makes it so it's canon, so whatever. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I'm sure they could do that stuff. I think with F-Stop, we had kind of envisioned something that was more Aperture. It was kind of like not just Portal, but Aperture as a whole. And a lot of the Cave Johnson stuff actually came from that period where we were working on this totally different thing. And then that sort of morphed into where it was later. So we didn't lose a lot of work there. It just kind of took on a new life. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, I never say never because actually a big part of what made Portal 2 work is that when we started Portal 2, we were like in this mindset of we're going to do this different mechanic. We're going to change it up a bit. People want new things. They don't want the same old thing. And we just... Oh, we just beat our head against the wall for six months. And then it was getting kind of dire. And we were like, I don't think this is going to work. We're, you know, we're saying we're making portal and there's no portal gun. And at that time, the company went off to do Left for Dead. And so almost everybody went to work on that to help ship it. And then myself, Garrett Ricky, and John Guthrie, who's like a, a super genius, like HL2 designer, like most of the most awesome stuff in Half-Life and HL2, John was a part of. Um, he's just amazing. The three of us were kind of left behind in it. Um, Scott Lynch, who, who's the, um, 
like what is he now i guess he's the ceo i don't know he, he was one of the biz guys he's like the master biz guy he came to us and said hey xbox wants you to make portal for the um or sorry microsoft wants you to make x uh portal for the xbox can you do that and we we're like yeah we'll just port it and then we had a thought we were like well actually there's this cool mod that came out that adds a bunch of mechanics maybe we can put that in as well um, and clean it up and then that'll add a little extra value it'll make the xbox version special and so we worked there was, it was like a really young guy in israel i think and he had made it so we we had um, licensed it from it and we took it on board and we kind of cleaned it up and made it our own and so it was just the three of us um, for the most part working on that but it was really crucial to portal 2's development because it made us back up and sort of resaturate ourselves as developers in portal and take on these new mechanics and go oh you know actually I think there are more things we can do here. And I think we've been too quick to dismiss how much more we can do, which seems more obvious in retrospect. But at the time mm. it felt like, you know, we, we, we were kind of new designers coming in. Um, uh, like I, you know, I was coming off EP2 and I was kind of taking over portal. So I, I was sort of not really as um, immersed in it. So going through that product, even though it was relatively simpler, it made us really back up and go, Hey, actually, I think there's something here. And so when that finished and the team came back, we started to transition people into these new ideas. And that's really when Portal 2 took off. So I feel like if that Xbox port wouldn't have happened, Portal 2 may not have happened, right? Or it may have happened in this really different way that I wouldn't have been involved in or you know, could have come years later. So it's, it's just always interesting, those weird little lucky breaks that happen that make you like pause and reflect. Um, and that's always been the, the case at, at Valve and everywhere I've worked is always this reflection point where you're like, our game is awful. And then you kind of back up and go, <laughs> how do we make our game not awful? And, and we were lucky at Valve that we could do that. A lot of game companies have that inflection point and then their publisher's like, great, okay, bye. And they take it and you know they, they kind of know it's going out the door un unfinished. But we were lucky at Valve, we could always have that inflection point and then kind of sit down and go, okay, let's rip this up. Let's take the good parts. Let's, let's piece it back together. And that always gave us the ability to really make really great products, I think, is that we could take the time to refine what we had and to really sit back and analyze it versus just going, uh, we just got to get this out the door. That's our best shot. Like that's the best we could do in the time we had. Um, and so, yeah, I was always felt really fortunate that we could do that there. Mm. Was it always intentional to add stuff from portal one, like in terms of little Easter eggs, I think if I remember correctly, there's like one chamber in portal two chamber 19, maybe. And it's one of the rooms from portal that's reversed, I think, or it's backwards. Yeah. So, uh, some, there's kind of two things there. One is, yeah, we, we definitely wanted to tie the two in. So there's lots of Ratman stuff and what happened with him. But I personally took a lot of inspiration. We had this problem in the game, which was if you just played Portal, we didn't want to make you learn portals all again. But at the same time, if you'd never played Portal, we had to teach you. So I was like, okay, how do we do this in a way that's good for both? And I was really inspired personally by Super Metroid. I always loved the way Super Metroid started out where it's like, you're coming down to the planet and you're going through, you know, you're kind of going through it backwards, right? You're like going through where mother brain is and you're doing all that stuff and then you turn it on and everything comes back to life. And that was really where I was like, Hey, let's do this. Let's have you. So you're going back through the chambers, but now they're all derelict and they're beat up and they're not quite working and they're they're You know, everything's broken. And so that gave us a way, if you played the original game, you're like, Oh, this is cool. Yeah. Um, I know how to do this. I'll breeze right through it, but I'm getting to see the, the the cool new setting. And if you'd never play Portal, then you're getting trained as well along the way. And, and for the most part, we used all the puzzles. There were a couple that in hindsight, we were able to tweak. So if you go back, they're not canonically correct. There are a few that we made better because there was some randomness that we took out. But by and large, we we were able to kind of um, do that. So that was that was a nice way to tie the two in. That did a bunch of heavy lifting on the storytelling, but also did a lot more heavy lifting on you know, how do we get you up to speed with all, like, there's a whole game before this. We don't know if you played it. How can we as tersely as possible kind of get you up to speed? Yeah. Well, you did a good job because I actually played Portal 2 before Portal 1. Oh, nice. Then uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Then I went back and played <laughs> Portal 1. But yeah, so yeah. It, it was very easy for me to get into it and understand the oh. mechanics. So you did a good job. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, we, got, we worked it out. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, how much of the GLaDOS stuff changed at all? Did GLaDOS change much or because I, I know originally because <laughs> when you first start off Portal 2, there's the announcer that speaks. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a file where it used to be GLaDOS or is you were going to use GLaDOS and then it got replaced with the announcer, like an old yeah. pre-recording or something. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, I don't remember a Glad Gladys having those lines at some point in, in our, so sorry, I always give you way more back, but maybe that's what you want. <laughs> There's always <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, so at Valve, we would do this thing called Overwatch, where basically we would make what was a, effectively a demo and then show it to our peers and they would break down what was good or bad. And that was kind of the inflection point that we had. So they would say like, this is really good. This stuff you're doing is dumb. Don't do that. And then the team would go back and, you know, pick up and try to build the real game after that. So in that period before that, it's kind of like, you know, we're building that Overwatch demo. That was sort of more of a hub structure. And in that hub structure, GLaDOS was, you were rebuilding her. So you were kind of going down these hubs to grab cores and bring them back to her. So you were trying to rebuild her to the point where she would basically help you out. It never really worked story-wise because you're like, why am I helping her? It was kind of weird. Yeah. But um, so that, that's why we didn't keep that part. It was just a, an idea. But what Wheatley came out of getting those cores and interacting. Um, but anyway, so so after that, we kind of knew, okay, we want you to put GLaDOS back together, but it has to be kind of antagonistic from the beginning. And at some point, GLaDOS didn't know who you were. And it was like she was going to have amnesia, and then she was going to slowly figure out who you were, and it was going to be a problem. But that never worked either because characters would, like the player would go to GLaDOS, and she's like, who are you? And they're like, well, I know who you are. It doesn't make sense that you don't know who I am. Even if she had amnesia, it didn't feel good. So we just we just cut that, and she was like on you right away. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't remember Gladys having those announcement parts in the beginning. I think that announcer section was just those guys going, hey, what would it be like to have to record a bunch of lines of like an apocalypse has occurred, but we don't know which of the apocalypses has occurred. So like they just got so much content out of that that they just were like riffing forever. So it worked out pretty well as a structure for them. What was it like doing the turn, you know, where Wheatley becomes the antagonist? Mm -hmm. was, it, was there I much refinement with that? Or was that pretty set from the get-go? It was, I'm trying to think on that one. I think from the, I think for a while we knew that was going to happen because we, we wanted that section afterwards. I'm trying to think. There's so many whiteboard meetings. They all blur into, <laughs> that's, that's where it blurs the whiteboard meetings. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so that wasn't too bad. I think the harder part was kind of going, well, how do we sell Wheatley um, kind of turning on you? And he doesn't really necessarily, he kind of is mad at GLaDOS and you're just sort of collateral damage that goes with it until later when he, he's kind of taken over. But I think once they had the idea of him being this kind of like idea suppression core where he's like the, the dumb tumor, um, then that all started rolling in. It was like, okay, he's got to, we got to, you know, replace GLaDOS and then all this stuff's going to happen. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the hardest part, if I recall, was just figuring out like, okay, how are we going to make it plausible that he takes over and becomes this villain in the span of like five minutes. And I think part of it is just Stephen Merchant was great. Like he was just able to ad lib and sell so much of that character that you just kind of went along with it because it was hilarious. And I think also Wheatley was dumb enough that you were kind of like, yeah, it doesn't seem like it would take much to corrupt him. <laughs> like <laughs> The barest little hint of power and he's going to be off on his own. So it ended up working out better. But that was one of those things where I think we, we kind of stressed over it. And then once we had recorded it, and kind of saw it in place. We're like, oh, okay, it kind of works. It's, it's not as bad as we thought. So mm. yeah, sometimes you just don't know until you get the real dialogue and kind of put it all together. So given the weight of expectations that you had on yourself being mm. the project lead, was there any point in time where you're just being overwhelmed and you're like, oh, how am I going to do oh, this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I was overwhelmed from day one. Um, it, it was tough. I mean, from my own personal standpoint, I, I've wanted to make games since I first got a nintendo back when i was eight right mm. so all my life that's what i wanted to do that's what i wanted to do and i think getting to the point of being a project lead even though i mean a project lead developed doesn't mean you're like the design king it just means you're mostly managing people but even still it was kind of like for me it was my chance to go okay now i can actually prove what i've thought which is that i'm okay at making games but if i mess this up then i'm not going to get another <laughs> chance and maybe i've been wrong all this time so there was that that yeah that weight of expectation and, and i think it was tough too i remember so Garrett, Ricky, um, he was a really young guy at the time too. Um, and he had just come off a of portal. So you imagine like you go from DigiPen to this big game company to suddenly having this massive hit on your hands to then being like the co-lead of this big follow-up. And you're just like, Bruh. so he and I would just, we would always just steal off in the middle of the day and like go to some, like we literally would go to like some parking ramp and just stand there and like talk about what we're going to do and like, okay, what if we did this? What if we did this? What if we did this? And so we, he and I just sort of like did a ton of work in the beginning, trying to figure out how to even structure anything and how to move forward. Cause it, it was hard too, because valve doesn't really have a process per se. Like the process is sort of whatever you make it. 
So I wasn't coming in going, oh, okay, these are all the tried and true methods I use to make this work. It was sort of like, this is a different project than we've ever done with a different team than we've ever done with different people. So how are you going to make it work? Make it work. You know, and I'm like, you know, however old I was at the time, like 26. I'm like, great, thanks. So a lot of it was just trying to do it on the fly and, you know, trying to find like um, management software that was all useless. And yeah, in the end, it was just all <laughs> d- uh, Google documents, but, but it is hard. I mean, I think, um, you know, I was, I had, I guess I'd been married for a couple of years at that point. And it, the game making is really stressful. And as I'm sure yeah. you've talked to a ton of people, like anytime you have an creative endeavor and you have a deadline, you're just going to have this nasty crunch, right? Like, I don't know how to get around it. Not, I mean, there's ways to get around it. If a manager is giving you a dumb deadline, that's stupid, right? They should make realistic deadlines. But part of the problem we always had is that we were kind of making this problem for ourselves because we loved what we were doing. So we just kept adding stuff. And then it's like, no, 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 no. Like we actually have to finish this. Oh, but I want to add some stuff, you know? And so we were always kind of making our own lives miserable because we were, you know, we just kept adding things in and that's, that's part of the passion that makes the project good. So it's like, if you'd strip that away, the game wouldn't be half of what it is, but at the same time, it did cost a lot of us, a lot of our lives. Right. It was just, I mean, I think all the yeah. gray in my beard comes from portal too. Um, so it was tough. I mean, it, my wife was getting really tired of the project and, and it was kind of weird, like a mistress because I was working all these hours. And I think I was just so caught up in this. It was like, it's all I thought about was what are we going to run into the next day? Like, what do I need to do the next day? Where are we going to go from design? So it was just this constant uh, stress of, are we going to mess this up? Are we going to make something people hate? Are they going to be like, man, I love Portal, but Portal 2 is so awful. Like, why did they do that? Valve has finally made a terrible game. And like all these things just running around your head. Like, I'm going to be the guy who like ruins everything for everybody, all this stuff we work for. Um, and it was tough. I mean, in the last, I think in the last three weeks, my wife literally was like, look, we're getting a divorce if you don't stop. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I called the next day and was like, I can't come into the office. Like I, uh, 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 someone else who had been doing a really great job on the project CUDA, I just called him as like, all right, you got to go talk to PlayStation about um, us on the PS3 and I can't come into the office for a couple of weeks. And it wasn't the worst thing in the world because basically at that point we had kind of, we had wrapped up stuff enough that it was okay. But it was a really weird experience because I went from like 200% on to just going, I got to be away from this. I got I to gotta step back. And it was tough after that because my wife was just like, look, you can't do that again. <laughs> you know, Which is fair enough. We've, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and now, and, and I, I know Eric Wolpa, like he had just had a kid at the time and he had told his wife, like, look, you're just going to have to deal because I am just so up against it, you know, with, with writing and everything. And I didn't have a kid at the time. So I don't think I even appreciated how hard that would have been. Um, and now I do have a kid. It's like, I don't know how I would fall into that structure anymore. Like, how would I make that work? Um, so it does feel like, it's a hard one to figure out. I do feel like video games in a lot of ways are kind of a younger person's game, just in terms of like the amount you have to give into it um, to a degree. Um, but it was hard for me because as a manager, I didn't, I didn't want to be the person who was like doing nine to five and then expecting people to do yeah. a lot of work. I was always going to try to be there longer than everybody else and work harder than everybody else. And that's just is not a recipe for a good life. Because um, how do you manage creatives anyway? Because creatives, you know, that. The, in my experience, they can be a bit more Mm. fragile as well. Yeah. Because it's their work and they're putting so much and it's art. So you can't just be like, no, this is not good. They might go off and cry, you know? So it was, it was hard. Apparently I was good at that. Um, Sometimes they don't know how, but I think luckily I, I was really lucky in that the people at valve were pretty incredible. So there really wasn't anybody that I was like, Oh man, this person, like, oh man, they just, they just turned in bad art again. It was pretty much everything was always going to be awesome. And I think that we, we spent a lot of time trying to find people to work on things that were going to be passionate about, because I felt pretty strongly that if people were passionate about things, even if they jumped in the deep end, they were going to make it work. And 99% of the time that was true. There were a couple of times where there were problems and we had to tweak stuff, but for the most part, I had tried really hard to get the team in on all the decisions. I didn't want to be in a position of saying, this doesn't work for the game and I'm not going to tell you why. It was always like, here's what I think the game is. Here's where I think we're going. And if we all agree, then let's look at this thing through that filter and see how we can change it or how it does or doesn't fit. And so I feel like a lot of people told me a lot of times that they would come to me with ideas or they would come to me with art and they would go away understanding the project better, not just 
knowing what they needed to tweak. And that was important to me because I felt like I really wanted everybody to be making those decisions about the game and to be thinking about the game at a high level and what the product was and what people were going to experience and not just sort of burrow down into, well, I'm just going to make this thing and it's really interesting to me and good luck where it is. Like I wanted everyone to understand sort of the context of where their work lived. And I think that just made everybody feel more invested. And like I said, we got more ideas because people were able to think, they, they, they felt the freedom to think at that higher level. It wasn't just, that's great buddy, I just need you to go and make this model. It was like, well, why do you want to make this? Like, let's talk about it. And there was a cost to that. I mean, I spent a lot of time talking to people and trying to communicate that, but I think the value was that um, we just had a really tightly knit team and people came away from that product being really proud of it. And they, I think a lot of that was, they felt really um, a lot of ownership and investment in it because they weren't excluded from those things. They were, they felt like they were on the ground floor. They were part of that team building it. They weren't just a contractor that was on the outskirts that, you know, was kind of looking in from, from where they were outside. Mm. So does your brain always operate like this? Like it's always going, 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 or did you get to points where you, your eyes would literally glaze over and your brain was fried and you're like, I have no idea <laughs> what to even do I, right I, now. I don't remember. So maybe it's the latter. Um, <laughs> no, I felt like, um, I have this kind of perverse thing where I feel like I operate well under stress, but then you're under stress. So it's kind of terrible. So I, I don't know. It's like, I don't know how to work when I'm not under stress. And luckily through the whole project, I was under stress. So I felt like I was, I was pretty on all the time <laughs> just because I had this, like this, uh, this noise floor of stress, but um, yeah, no, I, it was hard to turn off. I think that was a big thing because yeah. you would just spend all day thinking about this stuff and, you know, talking about all these things. And then you come home and you're still like, bzz, bzz, bzz. and I think that was, that was hard on, you know, my wife because, She'd be like, hey, how was your day? And I'm like, blah, 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 like telling her all this valve stuff. And then I'd kind of just be like, mm, and I'd crash. And she's like, well, okay, great talk. You know, like I'm tired <laughs> of hearing about this. Um, so I think that was hard. I think it would have been better to find a way to switch off, but but it is difficult. And yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and I have this question too, because so since I've retired, I have this question of like, can I make something really interesting if I'm not in that mode? And I don't know, like, I think that remains to be seen because I think even though it was kind of unhealthy and weird, you were just like, just saturated in these ideas all day long. And so everything was being put through the filter of portal too. It was like, I'd see something on a shelf and be like, oh, that reminds me of this thing here and we can use this and we can do this. It's like, you were just kind of vacuuming in the world all the time into this, this kind of creative thing that you're doing. Hmm. And I just feel like it would be hard to compete with that if I was like, going home and not doing that but at the same time that's not sustainable <laughs> so it was kind of like I felt like that worked for one thing and now you know I have to find a different way and that may just be a personal process thing of how I work that needs to tweak I'm not sure I think it's something that's echoed quite a bit with game developers I mean I've spoken to a number of them and it just seems mm. like one of those things and it probably is similar in the music industry and the film industry yeah. as well where you just can't shut off and you're just always thinking of the next thing Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I, I totally feel you. And then you add crunch on top of that, which which plays a part. I I imagine the crunch wasn't too bad though. It wasn't too bad. Um, we, you know, we I think we decoupled ourselves from the holiday season. Up until that point, it was always like holiday season's coming. We have to put the game out, so you get these nasty crunches up against that. And I think around that time, we kind of stepped back and we're like, is this even a thing? And we sort of looked at the numbers and we're like, I don't think this is a thing. I think we've been thinking this is a thing, but we're in a new world now where people buy things on Steam. Like, why don't we just release this in a window where nobody is and we'll just do that? And mm. so that that allowed us to kind of go, oh, okay, let's just relax that a bit. And, and I think we had like a press release where we were taught, we had like slipped by like three weeks or something due to like, I think we were going through certification on PlayStation. And so the writers just wrote up this funny little, like, you know, the world's smallest uh, slip is, or this, you know, the, the slightest delay has happened and we, we did it that way. So that, that did take a lot of pressure off. Um, but it still was, I think because we were, what did we put it out on? It was like Xbox plus PlayStation plus PC, PC. plus Mac. Yeah. yeah. I think even Mac. So we just had like, that was the bigger thing from a tech standpoint is it, our surface area for testing was so massive. It was just so difficult. And if, if you haven't been through certification on PC, we would test and do a really good job, but ultimately we're like, eh, we'll just patch it. It's not a big deal. But at that time it was like certification on those two platforms were super rigid. 
and they were they were different. And so we kind of had what we knew Xbox was in our head, but we didn't know what PlayStations was. And so you'd bump up against these things where they're like, uh, no, you're not going to pass because in the loading screen, this little bar doesn't spin fast enough. And you're like, oh, my God, like, why does what? this matter? Is that a well, thing? I, I, yeah. They, well, I think what they were saying is like, it's not interacting with him enough. So a lot of times when you see games load and you'll see like hints pop up, a lot of times that's trying to um, satisfy that requirement. So it's interactive or, or like interesting uh-huh. when it's loading because people are like, well, I don't know what to do. Like we're loading the game. Just give us a break. But um, yeah, so it was a lot of stuff like that where the game was kind of done, the recording was done. And then it was just a lot of like freaking out about um, all those things. And it's tough too, because for steam, we don't care. Like I can, I can fix a bug the day before and then it just goes out. Right. It's just bits. Yeah, yeah. We don't have to make discs, but for the other platforms, you have to go into their certification at a certain time. You have to pop out at a different time successful. And then you have this window of manufacturing. So you suddenly have this like really crappy thing where you're like, well, if I don't hit this a week ahead of time and go into cert at the right time, now we've been pushed back a month. Now production gets pushed back a month. Now all the advertising we did is useless or less useful. So we just, you know, wasted millions of dollars. So a lot of the stress came from that more than just finishing the game. And I think that's why probably after that, Val was less interested in that that venture. Yeah, well, how much time does certification just on one additional platform, how much time does it does that actually add to development? Uh, I, it would have added probably a month, it, just in terms of specific work that we had to go off and do just to make it work for those things, you know? Because it would be like, oh, we dip under 60 frames, well, it was probably 30 frames per second in this one area, that's unacceptable. Because they, they would be like, oh, if you get under 30 frames per second for three seconds or whatever it is, in certain areas, we'll, we'll red flag you and you'll get kicked out. So you're like, oh my God. So it was like, okay, like what are we going to do just for this one area, just for the PS3? And then we had co-op on top of it, which made it harder because portals were already hard because you could have a big scene and then you're rendering that scene again through the portal. Um, and then when you had co-op, you could do that multiple times, right? Because you could see through that portal, which could see through that portal, you know? Yeah. And so we had to do all this work around like, okay, we can't let you see through too many portals and do all that stuff. And so, and it was all really boring stuff, right? It wasn't stuff that was really making the quality of life that much better. It was just that those platform holders holders were like, and fair enough. They're like, we have to make some standard and you're going to have to adhere to it. Yeah. But it was super stressful too, because you go into certification and you just sit there. And it's just like, you're waiting for that ding to come into your inbox going, you failed. So everyone just stops because you can't do any work. You can't submit anything else. So everyone's just like kind of freaking out, waiting for this email to come in saying, oh, you failed now, you know, quick. And then you'd have to jump back on and try to, you know, fix it as fast as you could. And sometimes you're like, I don't even know what we failed on. So that I, I don't miss that. That part was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Has that gotten easier though with time? Like are the certifications, know. like are they less strict? I'm guessing not just because there's still discs being produced, but I know for Valve, we were like, eh, like we can put out a patch. And and I think most PC developments like that, it's like you do your best job, you don't want a bad release. But if there's some tiny little thing that a small percentage of people are going to hit, then yeah, patch that later. Um, don't kill yourself over that. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if CERT is the same as it's always been. Well, because there are a lot of games these days that get released in a broken state, you know. Mm. So I'm wondering if the certification has gotten less strict. I, I bet that's political. I think a lot of times, there because there was that that aspect too, where it's like, if you were a big enough game, they'd be like, eh, it's okay for we'll you, but slide, maybe yeah. not for other people. So, you know, so I'm sure like the Call of Duties and whatnot have, you know, they're, they're obviously, you know, kind of probably strong arming those platform holders a bit, but I, I don't know. We, we didn't have that much sway. So we just kind of did what we were told. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, before I let you go, uh, obviously I, I do want to talk to you. We did talk a little bit off air about uh, Zero Fan page and just what you're mm-hmm. working on. I know you probably yeah. can't go into specifics, but just sure. a rough idea of what it is. Yeah. So um, what I started working on was I, I built a Nintendo emulator and then I realized that that was the same chipset of an Apple II, which is the old computer I grew up with. Mm. So I was like, oh, I wonder if I can make an Apple II emulator. And I did. And then I was like, I want to put this inside Unreal Engine and make it work in real time. So I actually got the game, an Apple II working perfectly in real time in Unreal Engine. And then my puzzle brain was going, oh yeah, I can totally make a puzzle game out of this. <laughs> so then that sort of turned into going, okay, I want to let you use this tool and 
you know, the basic programming language and all the things that come with this kind of old school 80s um, thing put you on a dying spaceship and make you try to survive. Um, and so that's what I'm working on right now is this kind of idea of like, um, it's probably more akin to mist or ribbon in a lot of ways. And then it's oh, a yeah. lot of like environmental, like tinkering stuff and figuring out things by, by viewing them and sort of um, it's not as structured as portal in any way. Um, but all the lessons I took from portal carry over to it. So hopefully it'll be, it'll be exciting for everybody, but yeah, you can check that out on steam. It's called zero page. Um, and then, um, you can follow me on, on Twitter and you'll, you'll find it there. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it's been a nice thing in the retirement. It's really just me in my office, just kind of riffing on with all my experience and what I find interesting. So it's sort of, um, it's, it's a little sad. I miss my big team, not just because they're super talented, but it's nice creatively to like sit in a room with people and throw ideas around. So I've been trying to like, um, reach out to my old coworkers and try to pick their brains a bit and kind of get them to, to help me out with uh, different ideas, but, uh, yeah, it's cool. Hopefully, hopefully in the next couple of years, um, it'll be coming out. Yeah. Yeah. If, oh, well, if COVID you stops. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. That's just, the, that's the big question mark, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 But at least you don't have to be stressed and under pressure and that's right. The wife hounding you all the time. So that's right. Yeah. Now yeah. I can fit it in. I'm just at home doing it and yep. make it work for myself. So yeah, hopefully I'll find a, a healthier, better way. And, and that'll, that'll yeah. help. <laughs> cool well hey josh this has been a pleasure thank you so much for uh yeah. doing this so if anyone wants to keep up to date with um this game and you in general what's the best place mm -hmm. for them to do that yeah you can just go to um zero hyphen page.com or zero dot page um and you'll find the website there or you can follow me at uh at zero page underscore game on twitter um, and there's lots of stuff up there. There's some blog entries about what I'm doing. And, um, you can see some videos and presentations I've done about the technology. And if you grew up with an Apple II, it'll be uh, super familiar and exciting. <laughs> cool. Uh, I just want to say portal two, it's a timeless game. It'll live on forever. I, I, if Thank I you, had man. to rank my top 10 games of all time, portal two would definitely be in there. It's awesome. It's, yeah. it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant timeless game. It'll yeah, never thanks. age. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah, I was. I felt super privileged to be able to work on that game, and yeah, it was a good one to to go out on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool. Thank All you. right. Well, that's the uh, show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And uh, until next time, stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>